Welcome back to 52 Lockup. I am your Apple Teeny of uh, Bitten Apple TV. 52 Lockup is a series I started to talk about one of my biggest passions, true crime. A new episode of No Recap Maniac Monday for 52 Mondays, 52 Crimes. Hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to like, leave some feedback, subscribe. You know the drill. This is all YouTube. The internet, internet has been around long enough. Uh, viewer discretion is advised. I will be discussing missing children and the death of a child. Um, so today's episode is a 62 year old cold case so let's uh let's travel in time and i'm gonna walk you through this a little differently opposed to what i normally would do um <clears throat> on july 31st 1960 las vegas school teacher russell allen would be searching for rocks to decorate his garden at home right so he's excited he's kind of going through and he would stumble across a partially buried body of a small child in Sandwash Creek bed on Old Alamo Road in Congress, Arizona. It's about half a mile uh, west of Highway 93. Russell, he spot, they spotted the body uh, with like reddish shorts and a bluish blouse, adult sized uh, rubber thong sandals that were like trimmed down to the child's feet and with leather straps to kind of like fasten uh, the sandals to their foot. Um, the child toes and like fingernails were painted bright red. Um, officers arrived to find the children's uh, clothing in the shallow grave. The body was originally taken to a uh, Widmer uh, funeral home for an autopsy. Now at the crime scene, there were uh, tire impressions in the dirt showing the perpetrator drove off, uh, drove off of Highway 93, obviously left the body and then returned back to Highway 93. Uh, there were two sets of footprints where one set was obviously the size of an adult and the second set of footprints were a little smaller, um, which kind of gave the police the idea that perhaps the footprint belonged to the child and the child walked basically to their gravesite. Um, there was a knife found by the body as well. Now at Widmer Funeral Home, the forensic pathologist had determined the body was of a five to a seven year old and this is important and you'll see why later on. Um, they thought it was a five to mostly leaning towards seven year old white girl between the height of three feet, six inches to four feet and five inches, weighing about 50 to 60 pounds. Uh, the remains indicated the body had been there for at least about a week going on to two weeks before its discovery. All of the child's milk teeth were actually still there and in good condition. And they were completely intact. And for those who may not know, like, what are milk teeth? Milk teeth are basically essentially your baby teeth, right? Um, medical examiners, uh, they, they did not, they were not able to, like, define what the exact cause of death was, um, but they knew it was uh, a homicide. Um, I mean, so what they found is that basically the kid didn't suffer from puncture wounds, uh, even though there was a knife there, there were no bone fractures, um, but the only thing that they could truly conclude at the time in 1960, keep in mind, uh, was the fact that the child's remains were charred, just burned, right? Um, so due to the poor recovery of the body and its decomposition going over past a week and a half, roughly, they were unable to create a composite drawing, Ooh, I had to sneeze, sorry, a composite drawing of the child's face. Now, Officers have to figure out how to identify this dead child, um, which it's a missing child in the 1960s, right? I mean, unfortunately, there was quite a few of them, right? Um, there was a released uh, police sketch of the clothing, uh, but eventually the body would be nicknamed Little Miss Nobody with a description of the body. Uh, tips would come in. Um, they couldn't confirm who it was, who was, who was the missing body, right? So they're kind of just going through and at some point the, the officers got a lead where there were witnesses that stated that there was a family seen walking close to where the child's body was on July 27th and one of the uh, two children in the family had been wearing similar clothes, meaning that there would be one kid left, right? So this family would be the Davidsons. And after being interrogated for about an hour uh, in early August, it would be later confirmed that the family was hitchhiking and had no connection uh, to the deceased child in hindsight. Uh, the child's body would be buried on August 10th, 1960 at Mountain View Cemetery. 
there was speculation that the body belonged to a missing four-year-old, right? Deborah Jane Dudley from Virginia. Now, this was a whole other different case that police uh, could not close at the time because they knew she was missing from the body of her seven-year-old sister, Carol Ann, who was uh, found dead, wrapped in a blanket in February 9th, 1961. Now, I know it's a year later, but they were just trying to figure out like, oh, okay, since this... Uh, since Carol had been dead, they were thinking maybe they killed that one and then killed the other one a few months uh, later down the, down the line. Now, um, Deborah's remains actually would be later on found um, in Southern Virginia where the parent would, parents actually would be charged for murder. Uh, and despite their bevy of efforts locally and nationally, identifying the child became a failing mission. Um, so in 2018, now we're just speeding past all this, right? Because no one knows who Ludamus Nobody is this entire time. No leads, no nothing. So now in 2018, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out and offered to pay for the, um, to exhume Ludamus Nobody and necessary testing to identify the child's remains. Uh, Little Miss Nobody would be exhumed, tested with recent DNA technological advances. Now, here's where, where it gets interesting, right? So the University of North Texas for Human Identification would recreate a forensic facial reconstruction of the child's remains of what they thought may have appeared um, prior to their burial, right? In January 2022, this year, 62 years later, the child's DNA would be sent to Authram, which is actually a, cor a corpor corporation that specializes in forensic genealogy to resolve uh, unsolved murders, disappearances, identification, or unidentified uh, descendants, or obviously murder victims. So now here we are. March 15th, 2022, Yavapai's County Sheriff's Office was finally able to identify Little Miss Nobody into Little Miss Somebody of Sharon Lee uh, Gallegos. Um, now, Sharon Lee Gallegos was born on September 6, 1955, to her mother, Guadalupe Gallegos, and her father, who was a soldier, couldn't find his name. Um, she would be the youngest of five children. The family lived together until the father left shortly after Sharon Lee was born. Uh, Guadalupe's mother would actually uh, move in with them as well. So we got Abuelita, we got the whole family, and they're doing everything they can, right? The family doesn't have much money. Uh, Guadalupe was doing her best to support her family by herself by working as a maid at the local hotel. Now, growing up, Sharon was described as like a little feisty. I mean, she's four years old, right? That's what toddlers do as they grow up. Um, she was also known as a happy-go-lucky child. She loved running errands with her mom because being with her mom was everything to her. Uh, she was very close with her siblings. Uh, and due to her complexion being fairer uh, than her other siblings, she was actually nicknamed uh, La Guerra. Uh, some of you are probably going to translate that directly and be like, as the war, but it's actually a Mexican slang term used to describe someone who's blonde haired or like light skin, kind of like, you know, flaquita, morenita, chem, you know, chembita. Mm. <laughs> uh, does her complexion have anything to do with why her father left? I'm not really sure because he seems like he left immediately. Um, for those of you who might be like, true crime detectives or like, I want to, you know, figure out every scrutinizing detail. I'm sorry. I just don't have that information. Um, but July 17th, 1960 is basically how, where a lot of this kind of puts itself together. So it's a simple Sunday morning, right? It's the sixties, you know, very simple. Um, but there was a strange couple in the neighborhood with a very distinctive dark green sedan, right? They had two children in there, a, a freckle faced little boy and a small, uh, female. Um, they were in the parking lot of the church where Guadalupe would attend with her family. Now, the woman in the car had asked several churchgoers specifically about Sharon Lee and Guadalupe a few days uh, prior to the disappearance of Sharon Lee. Now, um, prior to the few days before she disappeared, Sharon was acting a little strange. She only wanted to stay home. She was very nervous. She was very, very agitated all the time. This kid is like acting weird, right? She doesn't even want to run errands with her mom anymore. So um, Sharon would be so upset, actually, every time she physically would see this dark green sedan. So if she started near the house, wherever she was, she would freak out so much. Four years old, she was so terrified of this car that when she would see it, she would ask her family to pick her up physically and carry her past the vehicle. This is giving the indication that they probably approached her. They probably tried to grab her and she escaped. 
Um, and we just she just wasn't able to communicate that fear to her family. Now, July 19th, 1960, the same woman who was asking questions about Sharon in Guadalupe at the church boldly approaches the neighbors and starts asking for more and more detailed questions about Guadalupe to confirm their address, um, asking about all of the children, especially Sharon, uh, their current family financial situation, and then told the neighbors, well, <laughs> my intention is to give Guadalupe a job because they're not doing so good, right? It sounds like a, that, that's such a BS. That's such a like horrible villain fucking excuse. But anyway, July 21st, 1960, Sharon would get up that morning wearing her pink shorts, right? White shoes to play with her cousins, uh, age five and 11 at the house. Now, once again, the distinct dark green sedan would pull up again to the house. At the same time, as it's parked there, neighbor 11-year-old Dolores Ab Ab Badial would be heading towards the store, right? So remember, this car is very distinct. It's very obvious in the neighborhood. She remembers seeing the car. Now, Sharon would be snatched up in the alley at the rear of her of Virginia Avenue home. The same couple who approached Sharon um i say they, they like go up to her and they're like oh we have candy <laughs> we have clothes if you could just get in the car that'd be really great and she was like no so she tried to run but unfortunately she would be dragged into the dark car um it is believed that the dark green sedan was a 1951 or 1952 dodger plymouth uh, sedan um by the same woman who had uh exited the vehicle the woman was described by witnesses as someone who was short, a little heavy set in her 30s, and with dirty blonde hair. The man would be described as a thin white man with a long nose, straight sandy colored hair. As soon as Sharon was dragged into the car, they obviously just sped off heading west and onto Fifth Street, never to be seen again. Sharon's cousins would immediately go tell her mother, um about the abduction and within the hour the police set up roadblocks and searched every vehicle they could matching that description obviously this lady didn't go to his capture because otherwise why would we be here so um it turned out um okay so we're trying to match up with the forensic reports, right? So the forensic reports stating that she would be dead when her body was found at least a week to almost two weeks after. So her body was found. So we're looking at July 31st. Um, by the time all this was starting to like connect, um, they missed out because of the incorrect age range. They were looking for a six or seven year old white girl opposed to Guadalupe's kid. They had Sharon's clothes. They thought maybe it was changed because she had a blue blouse on, right? Um, poorly constructed shoes because they took off the white shoes. Um, it was also even later on discovered that Helen Gonzalez remembers the car being parked at the house again the previous Sunday. So it, would be, it, it seems obviously that this couple was stalking this child for weeks. I mean, terrorizing her. She was obviously terrified of this car she was terrified of those people they take her and the kid's dead a week week and a half later why why would they take a child right so while investigators considered maybe it was for ransom right but there there were no demands for money right i mean there are a number of reasons why children are abducted right uh pedophiliacs right that's one of the top reasons. And if you don't know, a pedophile is a person who's sexually attracted to children as well as young minors. It could be for sexual reasons, which tends to be up there, right? It could be to have a kid. Maybe they can't have a, a kid of their own, right? We all know this. Um, it could be to sell the kid into human trafficking. I mean, there are a, a number of reasons. They tend to fall into certain categories, but for the most part, there's quite a few reasons. Um, you know, it was reported that based on the latest child abduction statistics in 2020, that there were at least 400,000 children reported being kidnapped. 178,747 teenage boys and 209,375 teenage girls. Um, there has been support to show that the older the person gets, the less chance it, it tends to be of them not being basically abducted since less than 160,000 adults were abducted in 2020. Uh, usually these cases are performed by someone who is like part of the family, someone who's a, a parent, right? 
but 1% of those abductions are performed by complete strangers. Uh, statistics also show that 7.57% of the abducted children by strangers make it home. Um, of course, as long as everyone acts quickly, right? So that's one of the reasons why they say, like, as soon as it happens, like, you gotta, like, jump on it, right? So the first three hours of an abduction are extremely crucial. 71% of, of, of abductions that are done by strangers happen outdoors. We're talking daytime, afternoon, usually when they're walking to and from school, right? You see, we, we, we all watch the same true crime cases. We all see the time frame. We know. It's not just late at night, right? Children from low-income houses are far more likely to be abducted, and the chances increase when the parents are divorced or separated makes kind of sense right because you don't have two people watching for the kids right the comparison is drastic when you look at the difference between nine in every uh a thousand kids who are experiencing abduction in a two-parent household compared to a whopping 84 in every thousand um in a single parent home like guadalupe's as a side note did you know that alaska takes the cake when it comes to the state of the highest abductions in the country um, kind of not surprised, uh, but I'm also like, hmm, but you know, we're, we're not doing any X-Files here. But anyway, uh, kidnappers, uh, similar to serial killers, will have like a profile, right? They know what they're looking for, like, hmm, this is what we want to go for. And, you know, whether they're selling or whether it's for sexual interest or if it's completing a family, right? And I know I keep stressing that, and you're like, well, why do you keep doing that? But here's the thing. I think it's a little strange that for a kid who's the lightest skin uh, and lightest hair of the entire bunch of the family is taken by a white couple with blonde hair, usually kidnappers fall into one or three uh, main categories, right? Financial game, right? We're talking about ransom, human trafficking, extremism, or emotional disturbance. Now, Guadalupe was struggling to take care of her kids, so it wouldn't make sense to fit her as a target for financial gain, right? Like, this isn't Liam Neeson. This is not what's happening here. Then we have extremism. Um, they're picking their victims based on either social status, religion, ethnicity, or their genetic makeup, right? Uh, and then there's also leaving strong emotions and a mental defect, as the last option as well. Like if kidnappers thinks that Guadalupe's financial situation is not up to their standards, they've decided I'm going to take her kid and give her candy and new clothes. So I'm quoting the psychological impact of kidnapping by Francis A. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Aquash. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm gonna have the name on the screen, obviously. Kidnapping is one of the most psychologically damaging crimes of all. Victims typically take many years to heal from the psychological wounds inflicted upon them, and some never completely recover. Kidnappings cause deep emotional and mental scars that lead victims to battle through issues of trust, independence, love, sex, respect, and a litany of others. The sad part is that they didn't even attempt to keep the kid alive. They knew she was already terrified of them, right? She's four years old. She's freaking out every single time they drive by the car. I, I, they, they walk by the car. Every, the, the kid's freaking out. So you take her and then you kill her and then you leave her body in a ditch. Like, was this about, was this a sexually motivated crime? Was it something else? Was it because she was fighting back? I mean, they could have just left her at a gas station or something like, hey, leave her in with the clerk, call the cops and see what happens. Or, you know, you know what I mean? Like, there were so many options. She's four years old. I mean, the case is still currently ongoing right now because now that they have an identification, now they can kind of start to backtrack and look at all the other evidence of what they have labeled as Little Miss Nobody because she now finally has a name. Anyways, um, I when a lion was reading up a bunch of things, if you believe you are about to be abducted, that's your moment to fight for your life. Like your life depends on it. Cause it does. Um, make a noise, uh, anything you can. I mean, I found what would be suggested as the best tips to help, um, I guess not be abducted. And it would include the following things. <clears throat> Finding different routes you know, to take when you're you know, kind of walking around, whether you're going to work, whether you're going to school, finding different ways to get there, right? Do not accept rides from strangers. Secure your home uh, with alarms and cameras because we got that option nowadays. Oh, by the way, Mr. Ballin has a collab with uh, Simply Safe, so you guys should check out his channel. He has like a promo code for it, so that's like a good security system. 
um, carry self-defense weapons from mace or taser or a knife. Only use it if you can properly wield it. Do not bring it if you're not comfortable or if you have not practiced using it. Um, that's very important. Um, you know, or you can bring something a little heavier with a little bit more punch only for your license. And obviously, again, if you know how to use it, otherwise it will be used against you. Tell your children never to talk to strangers, never to walk off with strangers and to always be by your side, especially in public. Have at least one person, one person know where you're going. I mean, there are a ton of apps that can help you with, with a lot of these things. We have Safety Pin. Um, you can uh, get yourself uh, or your or a loved one Invisalign jewelry, or I don't know how this is, I think it's called GeoBit. It's also for kids. Um, and we have so many more options than the days of Eaton Paz, you know, the milk carton days, which for the record started in 1979. So we have kids been going missing left and right, left and right. And there was no way to keep track of these things or where they went or what really happened. Um, and it's amazing that the technology that we have nowadays to be able to go back and go, oh, I know who this is now. Um, it's just, it's very unfortunate. And for me, it baffles me because I'm just like, she's four years old. She's terrified. Why did you take her? And then you just, you just kill her like a week. And my other thing is like, I'm trying to understand, like, is it because they realized everyone was looking for her that they were like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to get caught. But did they not think maybe they just left her somewhere like in a store because, you know, it's not like there were cameras like that everywhere in the 60s. It's not like where it is where, like, 1984 is almost on every corner. Um, just, you could have, well, they could have just driven to a store. Left her in a damn store. Like, it's not, <laughs> it's not difficult. Like, oh, this one doesn't want to stay with me. All right, guess we'll try another. You know what I mean? Like, why? And it makes me wonder, um, also, uh, how do they know about Guadalupe? Is is it because they happen to be driving through town? How far were they traveling from when they spotted her? I mean, I'm really looking forward to seeing this case completely closed once they fully identify um, the culprits who, who took her. And hopefully they, they can at least give the family that kind of closure. And it's sad that the, the family got overlooked because they were looking for like a six, seven year old white girl versus a four year old, you know, Guadalupe's daughter. Um, and in the sixties, I can only presume they would have assumed that her skin wasn't as fair as she may have been described. Right. Um, so these things like do come in, come into place. Right. So they may have been like, oh, she was, you know, lighter than the rest of us, but they may not have understood how white her skin may have been because genetics are not like Crayola crayons. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a sad case. And for those of you who may be worried about your loved ones and they go outside, Check out Invisalign. Get you a bit for your kids. There's so, so, so many options. Um, use the tools that you have to stay safe. Um, that's it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and I'm going to like harass. I've been sending all these links to my friends. Like, yo, that is for your kid. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yes, you have. Okay, listen, I can't have anything happen to Munchie. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And as always, stay vigilant, stay safe.